and welcome once again to Father Spencer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, your host at Gatekeeper, coming to you from where it all began, where Mother Angelica started everything back in 1981. The mothership, as Father Spitzer would call it. Email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Make sure it's spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. And check out all the Father Spitzer's websites, the Magic Center site, the Credible Catholic, and the PurposefulUniverse.com website as well. And of course, Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EWTN on demand page, new and improved, along with our YouTube channel. We recently added so many new programs, including that wonderful documentary, basically, To Believe, on Ukraine and uh, the persecution under the Soviets. Uh, you should really check that out. It's really uh, hard to believe, but it is uh, believable in the sense that it really happened. With that being said, we're going to talk all about our show topics, how the devil works. He's real, too from Father's very real book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, available naturally through our religious catalog. Please, you should have bought it by now. And of course, the book of the month, another great book, You Shall Stand Firm, Preserving the Faith in an Age of Apostasy by our good friend Father William Casey, another stalwart of the faith. And with that, we turn to Father Spitzer. Great to see you, Father Spitzer. Great to be with you, Doug. And if you kick us off with, with a prayer, that would be great, thanks. Absolutely, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the many blessings you give to us. In this Lenten season, we ask you to help us with uh, the gift of fortitude, uh, to help us in our acts of repentance, our acts of penance that we do to bring us closer to you in self-sacrifice. We ask you, too, to bless the good Ukrainian people, bless their resolve, and Please help them in their needs, their many needs, and uh, please bring a speedy resolution to this conflict uh, in Ukraine. Ask you also, dear Lord, to bless Doug, myself, our whole audience this day with your Holy Spirit inspiring, guiding, and protecting us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And speaking of prayer, of course, the Holy Father has announced that he's going to consecrate Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And EW10 proudly will cover that event on March 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So look for that. Again, it's for Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it's not making up for what some people thought was not done by John Paul II. This is not having directly to do with that. This has to do with the entrustment of Russia and Ukraine directly because of the conflict to Our Lady's help at this time. What do you think of doing something like this, Father? Oh, I just think, you know, in Our Lady of Fatima, we could see that uh, Our Lady just turned the tide of world events. Uh, I mean, um, you know, the First World War, bringing it to an end, bringing the, uh, the various, you know, flu epidemics, uh, uh, to a speedier conclusion. Uh, I just think um, the world politics changed. Mm -hmm. I think the whole of, you know, the southern peninsula of, of Europe was up for grabs, really, as a communist uh, place or uh, mm -hmm. a, a place of free uh, democracy. And just her presence galvanized uh, the democratic uh, unions, the Christian democratic unions. And so I think, honestly, uh, uh, if you look at that in Portugal, as I said, in the Southern Peninsula, if you look at, you know, Mexico and bringing, you know, the, this huge population around in record time, a consecration to Mary is a powerful thing indeed. Right. And, and uh, honestly, I just think we need this more than ever, because if she can somehow bring that incredible presence that she has promised us through um, you know our prayers and our acts of penance she can bring that to this conflict in Ukraine and and Russia and help uh, a heart of compassion uh, to maybe come over the leadership of Russia what what, what they are gaining from this is right. absolutely beyond me I mean it just seems like so much heartbreak so much damage so much you know violence for what for what uh, you know I mean uh, to, to gratify a, a, you know a, a crazed ego a power hungry I, I, I don't know I, right. I'm right. just sitting here wondering 
what is to be gained from all of this? I mean, he's throwing his economy into a uh, real, you know, uh, I think disjointedness right. um, because of the, the world separation uh, in this global age. And, and I think he's also alienating his own. You know, they're going to find out about this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how long can their, uh, you know, uh, news media keep all of this censored? Not, in, not, not well, in this day and age. You just can't. Oh, no. You can't I mean, plug yeah, all the leaks, all the holes. Nope. You can't, and and there's just too many uh, too many outlets. And of course, like I said, this woman reporter comes on the stage of a news broadcast and says, "Stop the war! Don't yeah. believe anything they're Hold telling you." Hold up that you. sign behind uh, the anchor person, yeah. right? Stop <laughs> yeah. the war, absolutely. And that person yeah. uh, is probably a, a moderate at some level because uh, I'm sure uh, yeah. they will not be treated well after that that occurrence. Oh, no. You know, Pope John Paul II consecrated the entire church and world to Mary three times during his pontificate, mm -hmm. taught that by consecrating oneself to Mary, we accept her help in offering ourselves fully to Christ. So that's really what's, uh, what's going on and, and reinforces the power of prayer, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, she's our great, you know, uh, intermediary and she in you know uh, I mean she's the I believe the, uh, clearly the mediatrix of grace and I think as she becomes powerfully present in the world it's not mm -hmm. just that her spirit of gentleness uh, mm -hmm. pervades but um, and compassion pervades but I think also uh, she brings a, a kind of a peace mm -hmm. a, a sensibility to populations and uh, who can doubt that that happened in the, like I said, in the Southern Peninsula after Fatima? Right. Um, and it's just uh, remarkable things. And like I said, Guadalupe, the effects are still going on to this day. She's, she's a powerful advocate. Right. Speaking of uh, Mexico, there's an article that says a Mexican diocese will now deny communion to Catholic politicians who voted to legalize abortion. Uh, and uh, you know, you talk about the transition mm -hmm. that happened in Mexico. Obviously, the uh, church was mm -hmm. persecuted for many years, um, yep. and here we have them taking a step that a lot of people here in the United States would like to have seen taken. Yeah, I. Well, you know, Doug, I I have to tell you, uh, uh, even though we live in a pluralistic uh, society and culture, I, I really do think this is such a serious offense. I mean, how do we look at, you know, th those who were uh, pro-slavery uh, all those years, you know, should we have done something at that time uh, too? I mean, who knows? I mean, at this point, it it's so hard to say. It's above my pay grade to say, uh, you know, who should be uh, refused communion and who not. I have my own personal opinion. I don't see how anybody who is actively promoting the killing of innocent pre-born children why in the world in conscience they think they should be receiving communion, I do not know. Mm -hmm. And I think at the very least we should help them to see that this is not a great state of, of soul to be in. And um, I, I think honestly you, you can't just say I'm doing it to follow orders. I'm doing it because my party has bid me do it. I'm doing it so that, you know, I can be a true representative in the democratic way. Nobody has asked any democratic representative to go against their values, to go against what's right, to go against the inalienable rights of living, unique human beings. And I keep bringing up this study, but, you know, again, we have these two uh, studies, 67 percent of PhD biologists in the United States are saying a new, unique human being exists and comes into being at fertilization slash conception. Mm -hmm. And we also have the very same thing being said by about 93 or 4 percent of international PhD biologists. I mean, these are surveys with over 5,000 biologists that are being surveyed. Mm -hmm. They're saying the very same thing. So if that's really the case, these are existing human beings. And when you think about the fact, you know, that a baby has a heartbeat, you know, between six and a half to eight weeks, 
place uh, in the womb when you think about the fact that the brain waves are going on six and a half to seven weeks in a baby uh, in the womb. When you think about the fact that a baby can surely feel pain at 15 weeks uh, in the womb, et cetera. Hey, what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about not just a human being, but a human being that is in some sense already, uh, you know, connected, uh, you know, to us uh, through the, the, you know, it's in, in its, surely in its developing stages, but surely this is a, a human being in, uh, in the full sense, mm -hmm. because every single solitary cell that will be produced in that human being throughout the course of that human being's existence, their whole existence, even if they live for a hundred years old, right? Every single cell will be produced by that zygote and by that genetic code that is in them at the point of fertilization and conception. It's a whole human being. Has all, have all the cells multiplied up? No, but is everything else present? Everything else is present. And so, of course, my one thought is, is it, really we have to stop this mm -hmm. and uh, these are real uh, human beings and we, we've got to stop categorizing real human beings into subhuman beings and uh, full human beings and tricks like that which are nothing other than sophistry for the sake uh, first used for slavery of course uh, that was the first thing so that they could relegate human beings to chattel that is to say to movable property so in, in the eyes of the law all you have to do is deny personhood they become property in the eyes of the law and that's the same thing that's going on today you deny personhood um, right. to a full human being that is, is sitting there in the womb or anywhere else, an elderly right. human being or whatever you start or denying. Like the Uyghurs uh, in China where they're kind or of the treated as China. if they're not really, you know, mm -hmm. because Absolutely. they're not up to speed uh, with the understanding yeah. of China. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you obviously it's been used again and again and again right. for horrible horrible, genocidal, marginalizing, biased, prejudiced results. Why are we backing this up? Why are Catholics backing this up? Why do they want to receive communion? Why would you call yourself a Catholic when you diverge so completely from right. the moral teaching, not only of, of uh, the church, but of Jesus? And by the way, uh, you know, this is taught in the Didache, right? This is a, a document that comes out in the apostolic era, probably in about 80 AD. The Didache specifically promote, uh, prohibits abortion on any level. It's right there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not like uh, uh, the church suddenly in the 20th century came to this realization that abortion is an outrage against humanity and an outrage against the law of God and the they commandment want to, oppress to be good women to children. Or or because yeah. they want as many babies as possible yeah. so there can be as many yeah. Catholics as possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those kind of uh, things. All of these chimerical right? kinds of sophistries, yeah. Absolutely. They're, uh, they're, yeah. Okay, let me ask you an, another article that uh, uh, this is Bishop Franz Josef Ovenbeck of Essen, Germany, uh, okay. citing uh, he has commissioned, uh, I think it's 17, um, 18 laymen or 17 of them women with conferring the sacrament uh, of baptism, basically, uh, because they don't have enough priests or deacons, apparently. What else is new? Uh, and, and so they're, they'll be able to do uh, baptisms. And I thought this quote was interesting from Teresa Kohlmeyer, who says, time and again, the church has reacted to external circumstances over the past 2,000 years. And this is the best part. She heads the diocese department of belief, liturgy, and culture. That sounds wow. like a department in Gonzaga. I mean, what what, what is this? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, is that what we have in the diet of belief, liturgy, and culture? Okay. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, what I are haven't these people heard being baptized in an American into? diocese? Uh, my lord. <laughs> so I guess she's. It is. A, it's certainly a, a, a huge responsibility mm -hmm. to be responsible for the belief. I thought that was a bishop's responsibility right. and for the culture, yiko. Anyway, but the, the long and short of it is, though, uh, if, you, if you're going to do that, uh, of course, every single person has the capacity to baptize another human being in times of extreme uh, need. 
So if, if there's not a, a priest around, a, a little child is dying, or a, a human being who requests baptism is dying, and there's nobody, uh, you know, an official um, you know, minister of, of baptism, that would be a deacon or a, a priest around, uh, uh, a baptized person could go ahead and um, baptize that, uh, uh, that person who's asking for it or that baby who's an extremist. Mm -hmm. Now, if, uh, at the same time, though, to officially designate it uh, as the usual creep, uh, you know, it's put under the guise of we don't have enough people to do it. But you can do it. There are all kinds of ways of doing that. Uh, it, we have baptismal ceremonies right here in the United States where we can baptize 20, 25 people uh, at a time on any given Sunday at any given Mass. I mean, this can be done. I mean, if, look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the people like... Uh, uh, Peter Claver, for example, uh, you know, he personally baptized 300,000 uh, slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's within the realm of yeah, human possibility. Well, yeah. How long is the baptismal ceremony anyway? Mm -hmm. You know, you can do, you know, if you do a group ceremony, you know, each baptism uh, takes about a, a minute and a half, uh, you know, officially to, to pour uh, the water and do the, the the sacrament of baptism on each individual right. little head, and then you seal that, uh, you know, with the various oils, and then of course at the at the end, of course, you can use the same right. But it takes, the same it takes readings, a lot of time to make all those banners. You know, you need to make a lot of banners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very important part of the ceremony, those banners. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we didn't have those same. banners to make. What would I do? Uh, what would my parish role be? Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> there it's, it is. Uh, but as you know as well as anybody, I mean, of course there's ways of doing it the right way. Uh, that's not yeah. the idea here, you know. Let's get yeah, on the no, program. Yeah, got to get right. in sync well, with no, what we're I, trying to accomplish here, right? Yeah, no, I think right. you got to be really careful about ministerial right. creep. And I hope the Pope uh, uh, makes uh, mention of this as uh, something which is not a good turn of events. I think we should... Uh, uh, learn how to just creatively deal with things. I mean, I, I thought the idea of, you know, that they try to import all kinds of new um, married priests, uh, you know, into the into the clergy, uh, and, and in order to do that, you know, the justification was we don't have enough priests in these mission areas out in the Amazon or something of that nature. But the point is, the church has always responded to this with additional missionaries. They made a call for missionaries and people responded. Mm -hmm. Has a call been made for additional missionaries in the Amazon or wherever it may be? And if, it ha if that hasn't been done mm -hmm. on any official level with any kind of encouragement, we don't need to change the entire sacramental structure of the church. I don't think it's a very good idea anyway. Mm -hmm. That's how things generally get out of control. But, I mean, but it's obviously there's a secondary agenda here, and everybody knows what it is. Right. Uh, we don't even have to wink. It's so obvious, uh, right. you know, what's going on. And, you know, it's up to the Pope to to settle things down in Germany right. over there. Absolutely. Speaking of that, and a couple of the articles I just referred to were from Catholic uh, News uh, Association. So that's uh, our CNA news mm -hmm. service that EWTN has. And one other story related to Germany coming out of our, our newspaper, The Register, uh, not to be too self-serving, Cardinal Marx celebrates mass marking 20 years of queer worship and pastoral care. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, why would you, you know, call people queer anyway? That's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, if this is really um, gay people or homosexual uh, people that are worshiping, I think it's a great idea. I mean, um, uh, why we would single them out um, uh, any more than any other group, I'm not sure. But the, the point certainly is that, yes, surely we want to encourage worship among every single solitary group that there is. And I think, you know, using, um, you know, these kinds of terms obviously has, uh, you know, uh, probably a good media, um, you know, a punch to it or something of that nature. Right. But, uh, you know, aside from that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why, why we are doing this, why we are saying this, why we are categorizing it this way. I, I think it's obviously for the sake of publicity. 
Right, and uh, the quote he added, a synodal church means being open, learning, and always breaking out anew in faith in the search for the possibilities of God, as well as in the question of what we have to say about sexuality and what we have to say about people's relationships. Um, you know, well, well, based upon that kind of thing, it sounds like we're voting on what we believe in and that we're going to have some progressive understanding of revelation. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to come out of the uh, synodal uh, activities that are going on. And frankly, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, um, we ought to be open to all forms of sexuality. In order for us to be open to all forms of sexuality, we ought to look mm -hmm. at the consequences of that sexuality on emotional health and spiritual health and relational health. I mean, in, in let's face facts, none of it is very good news. So if you if you really want to take a look at you know any practice, you, you say pornography. Well, that's just uh, you know uh, uh, you know it's a victimless sin. You know, you just let people go ahead and look at as much pornography as you want. Well, the divorce rate doubles, mm -hmm. emotional intimacies in marriage just go skyrocketing downward. Uh, risky sexual behaviors start increasing dramatically. Depression goes up with the you know in, in proportion to the more you look at pornography uh, if you take a look at uh, um, you know if you say well I'm, I'm gonna go for a homosexual lifestyle uh, we've already seen uh, and I've talked about these statistics well if it becomes habitual I'm just it ought, it, it bears mentioning that um, spiritual practice is going to decrease by about 50 percent bears mentioning that uh, depression rates, anxiety rates, panic disorder rates, major psychiatric um, um, uh, problem rates uh, go up by a factor of three times and in the case of suicide goes up by a factor of seven times for those who are living uh, in that uh, lifestyle. Maybe there's something amiss with doing this and maybe you know the teaching of Jesus and maybe the teaching of the church is important in this regard and we ought to be looking at what all the consequences are before we go out and sponsor these kinds of things which by the way if we're sponsoring them without looking at the emotional and relational and spiritual damage that's taking place when we do are we in some respects responsible for going ahead and pushing this kind of thing? Or should we instead be cautioning people to look at the statistics before they embrace, quote unquote, the lifestyle? I, I think we should be very, very careful about these kinds of things. And, and I think, uh, honestly, we need to educate people as to what those uh, consequences are. And uh, I, I'm right, as I said, right. I'm writing a book on this uh, called Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, and I am going to present those statistics, which, uh, by the way, these are not church statistics, certainly not Spitzer statistics. Mm -hmm. These are statistics that come from the archives of general psychiatry or from very... Uh, uh, prominent um, uh, statistical uh, surveying and study uh, groups in the Netherlands and from uh, good uh, universities in right. the United States. Uh, they're all secular sources uh, of this but they're data. Not, and they're not the statistics we want because they tell us things we don't want to believe. Well, that is true, and that right. is the difficulty. And I think there's also a mistaken belief, too, that respect means not telling the whole truth mm -hmm. about what is going on in particular lifestyles. And I think that, you know, honestly, that's not respect. Respect always has a dimension of telling the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, you might say you're being nice, and we've discussed this before, but there's a big difference between being nice and being respectful. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm respectful, I'm going to tell you the, the whole truth about something. I'm, I'm not going to sit there and hide all the negative things that I see can destroy you, destroy your relationships, destroy the people around you, and destroy your spiritual life, and wear a collar and tell you that I really am just being nice. Right. Uh, there's, there's a point at which you right. just got to say, don't you want to know what the... the these studies are saying, you know, and, and you could say, well, I've got studies too. Good, present your studies. But I've got really good ones, mm -hmm. and they are suggesting something which I don't think can be just glazed over. 
They are looking at certain kinds of really negative effects on emotional, relational, and spiritual mm -hmm. health. These have to be brought to light so everybody gets the full picture before we do any encouragement jobs. I mean, you know, encouraging sexuality, opening ourselves to the possibilities. Why would we open ourselves to the possibilities of a, of a lifestyle that could be really destructive to people? Why would we do that? Why wouldn't we be open to the possibility of go ahead and play in the, sh in the busy streets in New York City? Go ahead. You know, why wouldn't we do that? Because we obviously know that this would be crazy. I mean, this is not good for, well, the physical health either right. of the people playing in the street. So I do think, um, you know, it, uh, respectful people, is, you know, are n very respectful in how they present information. But I don't think they should hide information. Right. I really don't. I, I think they should pretty much say, well, you know, there are some matters of concern here. Right. You might want to know these statistics, right. and of course, if you ever get into some difficulties, if you find yourself in the 40% of that population that is seriously contemplating suicide, mm -hmm. hey, um, you might want to turn to the Lord, or turn right. to the Blessed Virgin, turn to the church, do something to bring yourself out of it, because if you keep practicing it, you're just heading into the darkness, right. not just spiritual darkness, Emotional and relational darkness. Don't do it. Right. Don't well, do we it. always think of St. Paul speaking the truth in love, right? To try to always keep those yeah. two things together, right? That's Let's get to right. a couple of questions from some people who had uh, wanted okay. to speak some truth uh, to us here, it's especially me. Okay. Uh, dear Father oh. and Doug, this is actually a point I make respectfully. Oh, to see, he must have heard you. To Doug. Yeah. On the Ash Wednesday show, you asked Father Spitzer what he was giving up for Lent. Our Lord said when recounting how a man claimed to be virtuous by showing others how many sacrifices he has made, I tell you most solemnly, he has had his reward. We should not quiz others on what sacrifices they are making. Neither should we make our own public. That's my penny's worth. And this is uh, Dennis. Oh, well, de you know, Dennis, I think sometimes... Uh, you know, uh, of course, my sacrifices are not great, so I mean, I don't mind talking about them. I'm sure about 90% of the EWTN watchers are doing far more than me. You know, I'm giving up beer and dessert, big deal, you know, and, and I am putting in some time on the exam and prayer. But I mean, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I'm out here proclaiming myself to be a saint. I think Doug was doing that basically as a way of encouraging people, uh, you know, to, to, you know, think about doing some things themselves. Uh, you know, if, it, and if I had any kind of, um, you know, uh, intimation of trying to call attention to myself, um, I, you know, sincerely right. apologize, but I, I don't think I did. I mean, my penances are hardly noteworthy. So, uh, but uh, th thank you for reminding right. us of that important absolutely. truth. Right, absolutely. That's why I took off my sackcloth and ashes and put my phylacteries <laughs> away for at least during Lent. Uh, here's another question for you. Dear Father Spitzer, I wanted to express how moved I was when you shared what you were giving up for Lent. With a big smile on your face, you shared about giving a beer each night and your favorite dessert in addition to your other penances. You're so very humble and a beautiful example to me and many others. I think what one gives up for Lent is really a personal thing, but you shared it so willingly. Thank you and God bless you abundantly. And this is a regular viewer. Well, regular viewer, uh, hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, that was a very interesting point, counterpoint, but anyway. There we go, right. I, yeah. uh, <laughs> exactly. So I, anyway, I, I think, uh, you know, that was the intention, honestly, uh, was to just give people a little sense of encouragement for their own Lent. But like I said, I'm hardly the, the, the saint in the, in, the, in the group. I'm uh, your basic, um, basic uh, struggler toward salvation. Uh, and I feel like I'm just with the regular folks in the, you know, slogging it out on the road to salvation with the good grace of our Lord and Our Lady. Well, that's the best encouragement for people to see that that's, yeah. that's what something that all of us are, uh, can actually attain. So we're going to take a break. Much more ahead mm -hmm. with Father Spitzer. Stay with us right here in his universe.
Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe. A couple of great books you may want to check out for Lent while there's still time. Father Bill Casey's Making a Holy Lent and also Father Wade Menezes's Four Last Things, both published by EW10 and both available through our catalog naturally. Back with Father Spitzer and your questions. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, I watch all your programs on EWTN, and people probably get tired of my saying, Father Spitzer sells, dot, dot, dot. However, I must <laughs> oh, respectfully, here it, it's coming here, Father, it's coming. Uh, however, I must respectfully disagree with your answer. The person asked if we okay. must abstain from meat or do some penance on Fridays outside of Lent. I have been taught that the church has taken away the obligation to abstain from meat on Fridays and instead given us the freedom to choose our own penance. Isn't this correct? Yeah. Carolyn. Yeah. Yes, that's correct, Carol. Uh, you can um, you uh, you you have to abstain from meat on Fridays in in Lent. In Lent, but I outside think, of right. yeah, but outside of Lent, you can do whatever you wish, Carol. Right. Uh, and I certainly didn't say anything different right. uh, from that. So maybe maybe you misunderstood what I said. Yeah, I think that was probably as part of that conversation, and also the idea because yeah. we quickly go to the idea that's also. You know, you, you should be throughout the year treating Friday as a special day in the sense of saying you don't have oh, to give up yeah. meat, but you should still have some yeah, other no obligation that you should be thinking of outside of Lent. So, yeah, maybe maybe in that context. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next up, uh, dear Father Spitzer, what is the official period for Lent? I've read that it goes from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday minus the Sundays in between. I've also read that it goes from Ash Wednesday to Holy Thursday, but does not exclude the Sundays. Are Catholics allowed to choose which one we want to follow, or does the church have an official teaching on this? And this is from Nello. That's an interesting name. Nello. Well, you know, I mean, I have to tell you, it does vary uh, from person to person, but from a liturgical point of view, it, of course, it begins with Ash Wednesday, mm -hmm. and um, and then it goes all the way to um, Holy Thursday. Uh, now, you know, the reason for the exclusion of Sundays is because uh, uh, you get the 40-day, uh, you know, the Lent is 40 days of penance, mm -hmm. and so um, a lot of people uh, exclude Sundays. Uh, from you know giving up their penances and and the church has permitted that honestly for centuries right so you can uh, you know uh, uh, you know do that and you still would have 40 days of penance if you went up to Holy Thursday um, I mean obviously Good Friday is a day of penance mm -hmm. uh, so you're you're back on um, you know it's a day of absence and fasting uh, and then um, you know on Holy Saturday um, at, in the evening um, you are uh, uh, as it were, uh, finished with Lent. So basically, it, it does go from Ash Wednesday to uh, the, you know, Holy, um, uh, goes to uh, Holy Saturday with the uh, evening of Holy Saturday. Then Good Friday, I mean, uh, Holy Thursday, uh, that, uh, you know, you can dispense with fasting on that day, can also dispense with fasting um, or, uh, you know, uh, penances right. on Sunday. So if you were giving up beer, um, technically you could actually have a beer on Sunday if you wanted to, or if you just thought, no, I'm, I may as well uh, do it, you know, not just for the 40 days, but for the 45 days or, uh, you know, I'll, I'll 46 days, I'll do that uh, instead. And that'd be perfectly good. So um, uh, you, either way is, is fine, to be honest. Okay, very good. Uh, let's uh, get to one more, one or two more questions. Quick, on Judgment Day, will all the sins of each soul be made known to all other souls? Will my sins of action, omission, and even sins entertained via my private thoughts be made known to all souls that ever existed? Walter, interesting thing to be concerned about. Go ahead. Well, Walter, I'll be very frank with you. When you get to heaven, no one will care. And when, of course, we are forgiven for our sins, my opinion is, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the church, but my opinion is Christ would have no desire in paradise to reveal everybody's faults uh, to everybody else. I, I just think that's just... Uh, nonsensical in my view the church has not declared that to be false but that's my view and so I would say you know you wouldn't care anyway right. because you're in paradise and and everybody who gets into paradise would be purified but I just don't think Christ would even bother to do something like that 
for any reason whatsoever. How does this affect the unconditional love of people who are already purified in the kingdom of heaven that we're going to look back and bring all this garbage up? <clears throat> is this heaven? I don't think so. Right, right. And so this is my humble opinion, uh, but of course uh, uh, the church has a right to <coughs> change her mind and uh, I'm not changing my mind, to, to say differently right. if she wishes to. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I, I think obviously, uh, you know, by then, hopefully, no. you're free of your pride and you're concerned about being yeah. somewhat embarrassed, uh, yeah, which is right. the major thing. Care. What do you care anyway? And one last question before you we know. get to the book. In our Bible study, a person has, Dear Father Spitzer, in our Bible study, we discussed the unforgivable sin. I think you once said it was equating the work of Jesus to the devil. Someone else says it was refusing God's offer of mercy at death. Did I misunderstand you? What is the unforgivable sin, Diane? Oh, they're both. It's, it's one and the same. Uh, basically, who is your advocate? Who is the one who has saved you? Who is the one that has paid the entire price to Satan for you? Who is the one that gave the unconditional love that redeems all of us if we just but throw ourselves, there's the if, if we but throw ourselves upon his mercy? Now, <clears throat> if you tell, say that Jesus is the devil, you're certainly not going to throw yourself upon his mercy. Mm -hmm. You're doing the opposite. You're turning your back on his mercy. And if that is the case, what are you doing? You are turning down the merciful love of Jesus, mm -hmm. the, the one who is our advocate, the one who is our mediator, the one who is our savior, the one who has given us the mercy, the forgiveness through his act of self-sacrifice. Now, they're one in the same sin. So to call Jesus the devil and to turn your back on the mercy of Christ is one in the same thing. Okay, let's get to the book. Uh, and Satan's Tactics, page 189. We got kind of through mm -hmm. the middle of that page. We talked about the idea of people being overwhelmed by temptations and the fact that so much of life is overwhelming today. You also make the point that a person says, where did I get all this from? I'm not that holy or spiritually wise. Did, have you had that experience? Oh, many times. You know, when I was younger, you know, I get these incredible insights or I get, you know, what I call little leaps of freedom where, you know, I had trouble resisting a temptation for a long time, <clears throat> but I struggle, 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 and then all of a sudden you get a little leap of freedom. All of a sudden you feel like, ah, I don't care about this anymore. Uh, you, you, you basically, you can just turn to the Blessed Mother, turn to the Lord, and you can just go, hey, Blessed Mother, please help me out here. You know, I feel like I'm getting, you know, tempted and I just, just mm -hmm. want to keep focused on you and focused on your loveliness. I think uh, I really need some help here. And then, boom, you know, it goes away. And I'll call that, just for a second, a little leap of freedom, right? So these things happen to you when you wonder. Sometimes, you know, so, somebody puts a question to you, and, and all of a sudden you, you know the, the answer. And you never thought about that before. Happens to me a lot on this program. But anyway, <laughs> just kidding. And uh, so, uh, but the, the point is, you know, uh, when, you, when these things happen to you, you know, when I was younger, I used to think, wow, I guess I really have a lot stored in my subconscious <laughs> mind. Or wow, I, I guess I really am a very intuitive and smart individual. And finally, when I got to about 30 years old, I, I just you know, threw up my arms and said, I'm, my subconscious mind is not that smart. My subconscious mind is not that intuitive. I'm not that intuitive. I don't have that much stored up. As a matter of fact, I'm just above the level of we ain't no dummies. So let's face facts here. You know, it's the Holy Spirit. I know it's the Holy Spirit. And it's the same thing, too, when I get the rationalizations. Sometimes, you know, you're, you're sitting there and, and you're, uh, you're trying to resist a temptation. And all of a sudden, the rationalization comes to you as plain as, but everybody's doing it. Some kind of sophistry comes to you. And, and you know, black is white, and white is black, as St. Ignatius of Loyola, uh, you know, says it. And you've never thought about this before. As you know, uh, here comes the devil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's another spirit, but of course, that's why St. Ignatius says we need discernment of spirits because sometimes we're smart beyond ourselves in the rationalization department. Mm -hmm. That's certainly not the Holy Spirit. That's the evil spirit. Alternatively, though, 
when we have those moments of freedom and resisting temptation or just a, a, an incredible insight or intuition into something that's spiritually wise or some a kind of a freedom to do something that's compassionate or loving that we really didn't have an interest in before, etc. Uh, it's, of course, the Holy Spirit. I mean, he's, he does these things. He has these consolations that he gives us. He, you know, has his conspiracies of divine providence that he surrounds us mm -hmm. with. He's got so many wonderful things, um, you know, in, in his... Uh, a whole array of, of uh, uh, matters and so uh, I guess the, right. the point I, I'm trying to make is uh, do I think uh, that um, um, it, it, there's spirits operating in our right. lives? Absolutely. Absolutely do right. I think some of them are the evil spirit? Yes. Some of them are the Holy Spirit? Yes. And it's our job to try mm -hmm. and figure that out but we can figure that out with those rules for the discernment of spirits that I was speaking about. Okay. You also write here, it might occur to us that we are right in the midst of a spiritual struggle between the evil one and the Holy Spirit may ask, why am I so important? Yeah, that's, that is the, you know, you know, when I was younger, again, um, that was my question constantly, you know, why would the evil spirit or the Holy Spirit want to waste a whole lot of time on me? Mm -hmm. Because every single human being has an important role, not just on this earth, but in the whole cosmic struggle between good and evil. It's like when St. Paul is speaking to us, right? You might re recall, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, talking about you know, sometimes we, what we do affects the whole mystical body and what other people in the mystical body do affects us. And so he's in the first letter of the Corinthians, right? And so when he's saying this, uh, he's really trying to tell you that you're not just talking about what's going on in this earth. Mm -hmm. You know, you're turning to God is affecting everything in the whole cosmic order. What well, you know, God gives us this immense cosmic role to play in the spiritual order. And similarly, right, when we turn toward evil or we're doing something that's evil, we are actually affecting the entire cosmic order because God has given us this incredibly important role to play. And sometimes we say, well, I can't see that. I, I just don't see, you know, where I fit into things. Well, you know, I haven't seen my guardian angel, but I know he's there. I haven't seen the Blessed Virgin Mary up front personal in my own personal apparition but I know she's there and I certainly know that the Holy Spirit is there and I certainly know that God is there because I know them by their effects mm -hmm. I don't have to be looking right at them but the point that I, I want to make is after a while you know which effects as Saint Ignatius says which effects come from the evil spirit and which effects come from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. If you are increasing in trust in God, if you're increasing in hope and salvation, and you're increasing in your capacity to love, patience, kindness, mercy, not growing angry, not um, you know, rejoicing in what is bad, etc. Mm -hmm. If you're doing all those things, plus you've got greater resistance to temptation, a greater openness to virtue and compassion, hey, not a bad deal. You you are following the Holy Spirit, says Ignatius. You can know that the Holy Spirit's influencing you by those effects. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, if you're noticing a decrease in trust in God, a decrease in hope in your salvation to the point of despair, or a decrease in the capacity to love, so you're doing the 1 Corinthians 13 test, and you're, uh, how am I doing in, in patient? Well, I'm much more impatient than I formerly was. I'm much more unkind than I formerly was. Mm -hmm. I'm much more uh, unmerciful and unforgiving than I formerly was, and so forth and so on. I'm much more angry, though. I, I made up <laughs> and good. Mm -hmm. So it, once you get that test and you start looking at those results, and then you're finding that your resistance to temptation is really... Now, it's one thing to get tempted a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're making progress, evil spirit 
as uh, St. Teresa of Avila tells us, right? He's going to move heaven and earth to bring up all his evil spirits, uh, you know, to try and, you know, turn you around. Mm -hmm. So you can expect if you're making spiritual progress, you're going to get lots of temptations. However, if you've got pretty good resilience and you're maintaining that resilience or even growing in that resilience, that's the Holy Spirit. But if you're weakening and you're just saying, oh, I give up, I just can't deal with a uh oh evil spirit around the corner, etc. So you can tell by these effects which spirit you're kind of following. And so Ignatius says that's why you should do the exam in prayer, even even if you do like the brief form of the exam in prayer. Is my trust in God going up? My resistance to temptation going up? Is my capacity for love going up? And my hope and salvation going up? Is my freedom to, you know, open my openness to the virtues going up? You know, etc. Even if it's just that little simple test, right. how are things going? Because boy, the alarm bell should be going off if you're starting to see decreases. Right? That's when you have to say, all right. I'm getting my act together. I'm going to go to confession. And I'm going to get my act together, and I'm going to turn things around. And everybody has to do that. I mean, Ignatius says, "Hey, there's no Jesuit that's so holy, uh, in, 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 you know, that you you don't have to do examine. Examine prayer is the one thing you should never give up, ever, 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 because you just got to be attentive to the alarm bells mm -hmm. if things are starting to turn around." So even just take that little right. five and, point And the sooner test. you realize that things are slipping, the easier it is to yep. correct, right? That's right. And like confession's a great way to correct, but then following up on the confession, just what are some of the little baby steps I can take to uh, uh, essentially um, do something more to stay out of that, you know, backsliding or that slipping uh, back into the um, old habits. Right. So th those are the, right. that's the... You also, you, you alluded to this uh, just before you, and, and the quote here is, yet as we move on to the path of spiritual moral conversion, we present a much greater potential to help for the Lord, but much greater threat to the evil one. So why wouldn't somebody say, well, why don't I just kind of stay off the radar and I'll be okay? Yeah, because of course your job is not just to save yourself, Right. Uh, anybody who starts getting proficient at resisting temptation, anybody who starts manifesting signs of being a genuine sort of holy person or say, uh, somebody who can be trusted in spiritual wisdom, if you start doing that, well, then you're trouble for the evil spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could actually influence not just one or two people, you might influence dozens of people or hundreds of people or more. And of course, that's, you know, the, whole, the evil spirit does not like that one bit. So, of course, he's got to, as St. Teresa would say, he's got to move everything he can, uh, you know, uh, against you. He's got to really try to get you uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to reverse course. And, and he's very sly at it. You know, he appears as an angel of light. He appears with rationalizations. He's very sly at how he slips things in and works on you gradually. Or sometimes, I, I get the old bait mm -hmm. and switch. There's two or three uh, deadly sins that I'm more vulnerable to. So, of course, I've got the eagle eye mm -hmm. on those deadly sins. Mm -hmm. And then he switches up on you. Right, so he basically will do something out of the blue, you know, so ordinarily you might not be tempted by X, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden he throws that baby right in there, and then the next thing that happens is you're slipping right down that stream, because you don't think it's that important. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, uh, you know, you get pretty good at recognizing though, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, this is not my normal sin. But I'm going to a place I don't want to go to. Mm -hmm. I, I got to turn around, around on this deal. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, your basic, uh, you know, thought is that exam in prayer, even if it's just that five-point checklist. How's the trust level? How's the hope level? How's the love level going? How's the resistance to temptation level? And how's the um, appropriation, openness to virtue level going? Those five things, just check them out. If it's just that, five minutes in the evening, checking that out and seeing what's going on. And then if you start seeing slippage, mm -hmm. right, then trying to identify where's the slippage, 
what's going on, and then you got to plan a strategy. Always put the confession in, and in Lent right now, this is mm -hmm. a great time to get the confession in there. That's the time to turn things around. And then after the confession, get those steps to try and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, resist those temptations or try not to get fooled by that devil appearing as an angel of light again. So that's your, uh, that, right. that's a and key one strategy. The, right, you, mm -hmm. you, say, you note the fact that Jesus speaks frequently about perseverance because it's one of the most important dimensions of spiritual and moral conversion. Isn't that an issue for us today? It is because we are the most impatient culture in the world. We're just, and I'm impatient. I mean, uh, we're just used to turn around, turn around, turn around all the time, right? And and okay, we got that done, got that off the list, you know. And and, and the internet stuff is bringing info in as quickly as you can through the email and through every other. Uh, you know, I don't do the the social media, but mm -hmm. you know, all the younger people do. And and so the the main thing though is when all that's going on. We just were used to such instant response. We're almost oblivious mm -hmm. to the little subtleties that the evil spirit can start wedging in there. We're almost oblivious to little things that are going on in our lives. The idea, you know, I, I was reading, you know, um, Introduction to the Devout Life by uh, St. Francis de Sales. It's a great book. Right. But, you know, sometimes you look at that and you go, who has time to do all of this? <laughs> In our culture, it's very, very difficult to do all of those things because we just don't have those gigantic contemplative moments, right? We just, we just don't, and and, and we're not used to it. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and, unless we sort of go on a silent retreat and get used to it, or sort of build up a capacity to do those things, uh, you know, we really have to to uh, to take steps. Uh, you know, genuine steps, even if it's just the five-minute deal, mm -hmm. uh, something along those lines to, to make sure we're staying on the path because it's so easy to get off the path in this culture. And I'll tell you, the Internet is not easy to deal. I, right. I'm lucky I'm blind. I'm happy I'm blind in many ways because I don't have to deal with it. I mean, I, I just think, you know, there's temptations, not just, you know, pornography and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. That's horrible as it is. But the main thing, though, is like the social, um, the ego comparative identity and the pride right. and the vanity that's coming with the social media. And, and I mean, it's just getting faster and faster. It's right. not just uh, Instagram, it's TikTok. I mean, right. it, it's like instant, you know, ego push out there, you know, ego reaction in here. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And uh, I mean, at some point, we just got to get back to some kind of a routine of a little bit of contemplative life. And that's where Our Lady, uh, I think, can help. The Blessed Virgin Mary is, is so helpful. And, you know, I have some very good, you know, um, uh, you know, scientific analysis of the Eucharistic miracles and some scientific uh, analysis of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Lourdes, you know, which, um, you know, I'm going to put in my new book, Science at the Doorstep to Christ mm -hmm. and Science at the Doorstep to God. So um, I have those things here, but the reason is, is so people can see in our scientific age, Mary's all around you. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you know, it's not just looking at all the scientific evidence of the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe or, these or the Holy Eucharist itself as being the, the real body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is then going the next step and integrating that into our spirituality so that we're, right. you know, we read a little book on Our Lady of Guadalupe. We know her presence. We know her ways. We know the Lord Jesus' presence. We know his ways. We know how the Holy Spirit is kind of nudging us and helping us and inviting us. We know his conspiracies of providence. We know his ways. And so the idea you know, would be always uh, to know who your advocates are so you can quickly call upon them Right. Um, and because you got that familiarity, companionship with them, you can quickly call upon them in times of temptation. Like I said, Absolutely. you make progress, you're going to get more temptations just because you're going to influence more people. And if you're going to influence more people uh, for the better, devil's going to try and put in uh, hindrances in your way. Well, it's interesting, just before we go, we've got a minute. Uh, you quote Churchill here in his famous speech, we shall fight on the beaches, yeah. we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight mm -hmm. the fields and streets. Great speech, and you know, think about the fact mm -hmm. that uh, President Zelensky 
of Ukraine just mm -hmm. gave a, oh, yeah. a, a talk to he, Congress, yeah. uh, very kind of reminiscent of kind of that Churchillian uh, standing firm. Oh, yeah, help. absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I, I have to tell you, I think that, you know, as you put it, perseverance is uh, mm -hmm. the main thing so much. We, we get bored with perseverance. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, I, I, one young person told me once, uh, I don't think it was a Georgetown student, it might, might have been a CLU, I, I don't know who, which student it was. But anyway, a, a student told me once, you know, that, uh, that uh, you, know, per, you know, you're always saying perseverance, perseverance. I'm tired of perseverance. I can barely keep my concentration level up. It, you know, I'm bored with perseverance. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, well, Welcome to the club. There you go, right. Every last one of us is tired of perseverance, bored with perseverance, you know, you know, just trying to get another ounce of psychic energy. But the Lord right. sees it, and Mary sees it, and they really help us. They and, honestly and especially at this time, us. we need your blessing, Father, because the show's oh, ah, over. Ah, very good. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord who is our companion in this Lenten journey, the Lord who is leading us to salvation, to Easter, to resurrection, to eternal light and love. May that Lord give you the sense of perseverance and fortitude and strength that you might in patience persevere to the end and help others to do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next time. And don't forget all about Father Spitzer's books available through our catalog. Next week, we continue our show topic with How the Devil Works, of course. Check out those books and uh, Spiritual Excellence, The Path to Happiness, Holiness, and Heaven by Deacon Richard Eason. That's the bookmark airing this weekend, a very popular book. And we've got St. Patrick's Day Mass from Knock coming up on Thursday the 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Ordination and installation of Reverend Jeffrey Walsh as the 6th Bishop of Gaylord, Michigan, also next Tuesday, March 22nd at 3 p.m. And I'm Doug Keck. Thank you so much for joining us. We shall see you next time on Father Spitzer's Universe. Be well.